Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to another episode of Houstonian Talks. My name is Georgie and today we have a very special guest uh, all the way from uh, Kosovo, uh, from Pristina, Kosovo, Ron Ginovci, uh, a political activist and uh, someone who is very active right now. Welcome Ron, how are you doing? Hello everybody. Uh... I'm fine, doing fine, trying to prepare some activities uh, for tomorrow, so yeah. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit, like we talked briefly before we start recording, but can you tell us what is happening tomorrow and why is it so important? Um, we have a new Minister of Education because we have a new government. Uh, and for us, the actual Minister of Education is a very well-known uh, person for a bad reason. Two years ago, he got promoted in academic promotion process in University of Pristina, the main university in Kosovo. Uh, while he got promoted, we found out that he uh, has been uh, plagiarizing a lot of his articles and he shouldn't have been promoted. So we denounced him at that time. Uh, the case is still open because university pretends that they don't have the means to identify plagiarism and stuff. Uh, since he became the minister of education, the main person of education, we decided to make an exhibition of his plagiarism so everybody can now judge whether it is or not. Because you don't need to be a PhD uh, or anything else to, you have, you just have to know to read and to see in two articles that the phrases are totally identical and that you don't need anything else. So we want to, to kind of tell everybody that uh, this is how it looks, this is plagiarism, uh, minister is uh, one of those guys who plagiarizes, so uh, now we, we're going to deal with it. I guess uh, this will lead us to some protests next week if the pandemic situation is not getting worse than it is right now. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... Uh, we had we had some uh, some resistance from the police. They didn't want to give us uh, permission for tomorrow's activity, but we are going to do it uh, anyways because uh, the freedom for association is uh, something that is guaranteed by constitution and it's guaranteed all around of Europe with conven European Convention on Human uh, on Civil Civic and Political Rights. So you don't need to have permission for protests. And I so we are telling them, you know, forget about it because we are go never going to ask for permission. We can just let you know that we are doing it. So in order you to do your duty, but uh, just forget about me or any activist in Kosovo asking permission to do something that is in public's interest. That's uh, out of discussion. Yeah, just uh, we're recording on Thursday. So by the time this is out, uh, will be Sunday. So hopefully uh, when our listeners are listening to this and watching us, your exhibition is going to go well. Uh, people will hear about it, will be there and, and read about it. So we're just hoping that uh, you guys will do a good job with that. I got to say, before we even continue with the discussion, the case sounds really similar to a lot of, like a lot of other cases in Macedonia, a lot of other cases in other countries in the Balkans. So I'm not surprised that uh, someone would plagiarize something to, uh, to look better. I talked to some of your colleagues. Um, I plan to bring this exhibition in Skopje and also I will send it in Tirana because I think that three countries, uh, Kosovo, Macedonia and Albania are uh, in a very similar situation when it comes to higher education. And I think that we have to work together a lot in order to create a strong, uh, a strong tie of activism in order to oppose and resist our governments that are oppressive and suppressive. Yes, Ron. I wanted to continue this uh, discussion in regards with the coronavirus pandemic. So in Macedonia, we are having a tough time now. We are going through a, a second wave of the coronavirus and looks like it's going to be more severe than the first wave. So I wanted to ask you, how 
uh, what is the situation in Kosovo right now and how has the uh, Kosovo government dealt with the coronavirus outbreak? The previous government of Albin Kurti was pretty successful in managing the situation. We, I think we were the best country in the region, uh, but it is also something natural that we have as, a, as an advantage compared to all uh, others. Uh, our population is the youngest in Europe and one of the youngest in the world. We, uh, we are 75% up to 35 years old and we are 54% uh, of the population uh, until 25 years old. And you know how virus is related to age. So I think Kosovo is naturally in advantage when it comes to, to this virus. Uh, however, we also have the same situation now with the new government. Uh, they released all the measures. So even the previous government started like, uh, you know, uh, letting people out and removing lockdowns, but now it's totally free. And we have a, a, a similar situation as in Macedonia, but I'm hoping that the demography will work on our uh, favor. So since we are young, maybe we will pass it with less victims than the others in the region, but not because of any kind of managing or anything. Uh, so yeah, I think that we are more or less in the same situation. The second phase in Kosovo started as well, and it's uh, worse than the first one. Yeah, and you mentioned in your response to, to the question about the coronavirus, you mentioned there has been a, a government switch. There has been two governments that have been managing uh, managing the, the virus. And I mean, Alvin Kurti has become kind of like a household uh, name in Macedonia. We've learned about his rise to power. And then all of a sudden for us who are not really following what is happening on the political stage in Kosovo, he was out of office. So can you, like, can you explain us what happened and why he's not uh, prime minister anymore? Albin Kurti won the election uh, and Kosovo, to be honest, made us proud in the last elections that we had on 6th of October uh, last year. Uh, because it is the only country uh, in the region that is totally uh, changing like the government and those parties that were in power. So Albin Kurti was never in power before, so it was definitely new. Uh, it's a bit similar to Macedonia. It cannot be compared to Serbia or uh, Albania where you have just one party and that's it. Uh, but still Albin Kurti was never in power. His party was never in power before. Uh, in comparison to Sadasam, who was previously in power, uh, even though Zoran Zaev was uh, kind of, you know, new guy, but um, I think that uh, uh, it was it was a good thing for Kosovo just to have this change. Uh, however, uh, Kurti came with no uh, with no how to say uh, uh, he had no depths towards internationals or towards. Um, I don't know, oligarchs or s stuff like this, because he's the leftist, like the only leftist in Kosovo, uh, even though I'm not satisfied with his uh, leftism because I'm, I consider myself a bit more left. But uh, however, it was a refreshment in Kosovo politics. Uh, he got removed, as he said, and we have to say, because of the United States of America. So it was a direct intervention of a special emissar of uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, this guy is called uh, Richard Grenell. He was ambassador to uh, Germany, uh, but now he's not anymore. He's just the special emissar of uh, Donald Trump uh, to, to make the deal between Kosovo and Serbia. So as they say, the final deal. Uh, Albin Kurti didn't agree with him. Um, he refused to go in Washington uh, when he was prime minister just to be part of a already set up uh, agreement. Uh, and because of that refusal, the party that was in coalition with Albin Kurti uh, was pushed by Grenell. Uh, this is kind of, uh, how to say, obvious and evident in Kosovo. 
they kind of admitted the the, the party that was in coalition with Kosovo with uh, Albin Kurti. So now they uh, removed the government. Uh, we were in the middle of pandemic when the world didn't know that much about this virus. Kosovo was the, the only place in the world to remove a government uh, in pandemic. Uh, I mean, yeah, US does this all the time, I guess. Yeah, I, w- I remember talk like I remember reading reports and there was a, just some shady explanation about Minister of Health or something that did not agree with someone and 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 looking into it uh, you, you can definitely see how US and and their foreign policy and their experts quote unquote uh, have some uh, role in it but you guys had protests on Friday. So what is happening? Like, what is Albin Kurti doing right now? And what are the protests for? Like, what are you guys standing for? Uh, I was not part of that protest. That was kind of a manifestation of Vedvendosia that happened on 12th of June. That is the anniversary of, of uh, uh, Vedvendosia's foundation, the party of Albin Kurti. Vedvendosia means self determination, samo predelenie something like this. Um, uh, so uh, it was their anniversary, but it, it is also the anniversary of uh, Kosovo liberation from uh, Serbian forces on 12th of June. So they kind of manifested all this in a protest, let's say, with like uh, 70, 7,000 people maybe on the main square of Pristina. Uh, so uh, it was kind of protest, but also manifestation against the new government. Uh, on the other hand, they, uh, on the other side, they are organizing a petition uh, for free election, for uh, new elections, and um, which, I, which I have signed. And I think that already there are 200,000 uh, signatures. Uh, in Kosovo, by Kosovo law, you just need 10,000 signatures to send it in parliament for discussion. So uh, I think the, the aim of Vedvendosia and of uh, people who support uh, new elections is to have like maybe 300 or 400,000 signatures so that we say that this is uh, the, 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 a bigger number than the, the winning party in the last elections. You know, so you have the legitimacy to to, to ask ask for it. Otherwise, uh, the new prime minister is the person who is, uh, how, to, how to explain this to you, maybe this will look strange. He's not the first or the second or the third, not even the fifth most voted, not even the tenth. He's the twelfth most vo- voted person in Kosovo and he's the prime minister. You can guess now the legitimacy that he has, you know. Uh, and he was vice prime minister in Kurti's time. Uh, Kurti dismissed him <laughs> because uh, they caught him uh, collecting signatures of uh, MPs to overthrow the government that he was part of. Uh, it's a ridiculous guy. So, and he has no charisma at all. Like it's, it's really, really uh, unimaginable how they thought that this will work. So I, I really expect that this government will soon fall because they have no, um, no strong pillars at all uh, that could, could provide like uh, some power for this government to continue maybe for seven, six months. I don't expect that. I expect it to fall uh, immediately after the Washington meeting that they are going to have on 27th of this month. Yeah, uh, just to clarify, so uh, Kuvati and his party are, and I mean, pretty much, uh, a lot of people in Kosovo are, are looking for snap elections yes. as soon as possible instead of regular one, right? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. So, so regarding, I, I also, also feel like that the situation in Kosovo is very representative of other governments across the Balkans that have risen and fallen um, from outside influences, or maybe from, from inside tensions. But but my question would be like regarding Alvin Kurti because he's a sort of a weird a weird politician in in the context of of, of the Balkans which are mostly authoritarian at this point. Um, 
So like, who is he and why do people have such strong opinions of him? And of course, like, how did he rose to power so quickly and out of just, I, I, I mean, to us, it seems like out of nowhere, but what is the process and in Kosovo that led to Alban Kurti's election? Albin Kurti uh, is very well known in Kosovo since forever. Uh, he's very well known from 1997 when we had the first uh, peaceful protest against Milosevic uh, while Albin Kurti was a student leader. So Albin Kurti was a student leader in University of Pristina. And um, I guess most of you don't know that uh, in 1989, Kosovo's autonomy, Kosovo's autonomous province in Yugoslavia, together with uh, Vojvodina, we had almost the same, um, the same, how to say, uh, authority as a republic. So we could stop Yugoslav forces in Kosovo territories. Uh, so our uh, assembly could just stop and not let uh, Yugoslav, the federal forces, into its territory. So. It was almost a republic, but it didn't have the name because of, you know, uh, power relations in Yugoslavia. So Croats were in favor, but Serbs were not. So Tito kind of kept the balance. And, and Kosovo was autonomous province. In 89, Milosevic removed the autonomy and Kosovo became like a, a territory of Serbia. Uh, in that time, uh, Serbia started a repression in Kosovo, uh, expelling all Albanians from public institutions. They forbid at that time University of Pristina for Albanians. So they expelled all students and professors from University of Pristina uh, until uh, after the war. So uh, what, what happened is that Kosovo organized a parallel system of education. People were uh, studying, uh, in basements of private houses or in private houses that were released by others. In 1997, Albin Kurti, together with other students, organized this huge, massive, peaceful protest that was the turning point, uh, how to say, in, um, in, uh, in Serbia's uh, relations with internationals, because until then, Milosevic managed to uh, portray this as a problem that he has with Muslim terrorists from KLA, Kosovo Liberation Army. So when international saw students protesting for, for such, uh, how to say, fundamental thing as education, uh, they kind of started breaking up with him. And you know that in 1999, uh, NATO bombed uh, Serbia, but also uh, its targets in Kosovo. Uh, Albin Kurti was very famous because he had curly hairs, uh, Afro style, you can find some pictures maybe. Uh, and he, he was, his English was perfect at that time. So he was like a rock guy, you know, this kind of fashionable guy. And uh, he was an, uh, a symbol of that protest because they arrested him, grabbed him by hair and stuff. And he was a political prisoner for uh, three years then under Milosevic's regime from 97, no, actually four years until uh, early 2000, from 97 to 2000. And he has a great interview in uh, prison of Požarevac in Serbia, when they go to visit prisoners together with the Minister of Justice at that time, Albin Kurti holds very strong position and calls Milosevic the last remaining of fascism in Europe. Uh, so he was really, really brave for, for that regime and for that time. So Albin Kurdi always uh, had a respect in Kosovo. In 2005, he founded Vedvendosje, that is now his party. In the beginning, it was a movement uh, for self-determination that opposed the uh, United Nations administration. Then Albin Kurti uh, turned the, the movement to a party. Uh, I was part of Edvendosi at that time. In 2008, I became part of Edvendosi. In 2012, I left. So in 2010, in, it turned into a political party and entered parliament for the first time with 12, 12 seats out of 120. And now it's the main party that is winning the elections. And Albin Kurti is like the most promising you know, in the beginning, uh, I must say he was very nationalistic. His discourse was 
totally with Albanian unification of lands and stuff. Uh, but uh, lately we see more moderate discourse uh, talking about economy, uh, left ideas and so on and so on. Uh, so yeah, I think that uh, for now, uh, we might have a lot of disagreements with him, but Kosovo as society needs a change that is radical, as I think uh, also Macedonia needs one, but not Ali Ameti for sure. Uh, uh, Albania as well, Serbia, definitely Serbia is the worst. Uh, I think that we definitely need radical changes, not in the sense, because I don't expect any radical thing to happen in our countries because we don't have such powerful forces, but radical at least in symbolic level, like we have democracy, we exercise democracy properly like we did before this government in Kosovo. With, when we had Albin Kurti, it was kind of, you know, we can be a democracy. And I was, to be honest, very proud because I know that we had the best elections uh, in Balkans and we are the newest country in the region, so you know, it was a moment of pride, but it ended very soon. Yeah, just just a quick comment. When you said that we need we all need radical elections, and you mentioned Serbia, I was I was just watching. Uh, I don't know if you've seen it. You probably we all for have the latest uh, ad of Vucic's party with the dinosaurs and stuff, and I posted uh, that. I mean, and it is true. Every time I feel that Macedonia is doing really bad, I remember that Vucic is in power in Serbia, and I feel better. So, just wanted to say that out there, because yes, another, another. Let me add something. When Albin Kurti was in prison uh, in Milosevic's time, uh, Vucic was Minister of Information and the Censorship. So imagine, this is crazy, you know. And that yep. guy was never to prison or anything, like. Uh, internationals are just accepting him as he is, uh, a true radical, <laughs> a nationalist radical, as they call themselves. Uh, you know, yeah, I think that uh, a big uh, part of the guilt for this situation in Balkans uh, is also on internationals. Because they, what Europe did immediately after World War II was that uh, they had this uh, transitional justice process that you in uh, law faculty most probably know the concept. So Germany apologized and recognized all the crimes and the fault and the guilt. In Balkans, everybody is guilty, everybody is a uh, victim. You know, we don't know, actually we know, we know that Serbia started all the things all over, but uh, it's not formal. Like, if you if you see, um, we just saw today uh, a Serbian colleague from north of Kosovo, which part is controlled by Serbian parallel structures, uh, posted a picture. I can't breathe. Uh, a mayor of Budva or something like this in Montenegro, who was a Serbian, was arrested because he didn't release his uh, office even though he lost uh, the elections. Not the elections, but the assembly uh, voted to overthrow him. Uh, so police had to arrest him to remove from the office. And you know, she compared uh, I can't breathe moment with, uh, with the mayor of, uh, of Budva. Can you imagine? Yeah, the Balkans is a very is a very strange place for someone who is not who is listening to this right now and is not from the Balkans. So, it it's just so much fun to be here. I think I think Macedonia is a step uh, ahead uh, in the sense that the ethnic cooperation there is more authentic and genuine. I remember when I participated in a protest against uh, Gruevski. The big one, you know, that was organized by Satasama. Formally, it was organized by Satasama. I was there with the uh, with the group uh, that later became Levita, a party that didn't manage to go in parliament. And there were some other groups that I joined uh, in the protest. Uh, I remember this moment uh, when we were uh, walking towards the the government building. And you know the bridge uh, that is the Albanian part, very near to the government. Uh, somebody from my Macedonian friend said, uh, take the, the megaphone and speak in Albanian because Albanians were just looking at us from, like, from the balcony. 
it didn't it looked like balcony and i took it and started calling them in albanian to join the protest and uh, i when we when we reached the point uh, i saw an albanian guy with albanian flag uh, tying the flag the albanian flag with macedonian flag and i uh, still have the feeling you know, it was so genuine. It was not pushed by internationals. People protested together. And then there, I have uh, in my uh, uh, in my uh, Facebook background, one of the pictures is uh, Roma, Macedonian, Albanian, Turkish flags all tied together in that protest. And uh, the sign, no Gruevski in the middle. It was epic protest in my point of view. And I saw that only in Macedonia. You know, in Kosovo, we have ethnic cooperation. We lately had uh, a protest in a village where Albanians and uh, Serbs protested together to stop this um, uh, hydro uh, hydropower plant. How is it called? Hydrocentral. Maybe you say the same in, uh, in Macedonia. Um, they were protecting the river, but uh, yeah, the first time I've seen uh, such a thing happening was in Macedonia. I think, I think this is a, is a great point and I feel like it's often here and uh, the, the, the people in power often try to segregate us from each other, like the people, so that they, so that, that authenticity can be sort of uh, pushed down and cause any political mayhem. But what I want to know is, uh, so, so from, a, from a political system standpoint, you have you have the prime minister and then you have the president of Kosovo. So, uh, what kind what kind of a relationship was there between Kurti and and Hashim Tan during his time in office? Uh, they were the main enemies for years, and they continue to be so. Uh, Hashim Tan was the a political director of Kosovo Liberation Army. He was kind of, he inherited all the, um, how, the glory of the liberation war and he became prime minister and then president. Uh, however, in Kosovo, president has a ceremonial role because it's not uh, elected by people. It's elected, it's, uh, he's elected by the parliament. So the prime minister is actually the person that is in charge. But Americans are very openly preferring Hashim Fauci because he and Vucic have uh, an agreement already. We all believe so. They have an agreement uh, ready just to sign it. And uh, Americans are pushing for a fast, uh, for a fast uh, uh, agreement on 27th of June because they need it as a success of Trump for the elections. So what they're doing right now is that Trump is organizing in Washington a Balkan peace talks, something like this, in this situation. And uh, yeah, I mean, Kosovo is boiling uh, and they are t talking about some peace talks between Kosovo and Serbia right now. Uh, the transparency is far from uh, optimal, uh, far from minimal. Uh, we, there are only speculations saying that there will be territorial swamp, swap, uh, there will be like um, uh, uh, exchange of territories or special, uh, special uh, rights for uh, some Serbian uh, municipalities in Kosovo and so on and so on. So, it will complicate a lot the Balkans in general, I think, especially if the territorial exchange happens, uh, this will open a Pandora's box. Because I think uh, Albanians in uh, Western Macedonia will start fantasizing about it again. Uh, Serbs in uh, Republika Srpska as well. Uh, I don't know, you know how we have the maps. We in Balkans, we are totally mixed. And in comparison to Europe, we didn't uh, turn this into an advantage as a you know, good thing for our societies. We used it for you know, wars and stuff. Um, I hope they don't do that. If they do that, I, I'm afraid that we are going to 
enter a new circle of conflicts all over the Balkans. Because I don't think that uh, Serbia needs that much the north of Kosovo because there is nothing there, just three municipalities that are most like big villages, most like big villages. But I think that they want to open, to make, create a precedent that they then they will use it in Bosnia because Republika Srpska is a much greater territory and much uh, more valuable, I think. Uh, yeah, and I hope this is not the case because if this happens, I, I think we will all be in trouble. Yeah, it's it's sad to see, as you said, like Serbia doesn't really need needs that, but uh, just the whole political pressure uh, that is happening, like just all the the games that are being played that Vucic are playing is playing right now in Serbia. That I mean, you said it like it's a Pandora box ready to be open, and and if if it only happens just because Trump wants to look good before the November election, it's going to be the biggest irony of it all. And I mean, I know that sometimes people uh, it's like I'm someone who's really interested in U.S. politics and follow it with a passion. And then people would ask me, OK, why do you care so much? And then because of this, like this is a perfect example of how everything could go wrong when you have someone who's worrying about his political image uh, that is trump uh so he can look good for a little bit and then the whole balkans just go crazy so yeah i i mean i share uh your opinion and i just hope it doesn't happen i i hope that all sides are gonna do I don't know, I'm going to come together and figure out a way on how to deal with this without having the whole Balkans going uh, going crazy again, uh, because that's not something that we need right now, especially not during a pandemic. Um, yeah, do you, so, uh, yeah, just, just to add on this, uh, do you think, okay, so Kurti and his party are going for new elections. Uh, do you think that, and how would, if this new election happened, how would this change? Like if, like if Kosovo Serbia make an agreement, but Kurti comes to power again, would that help? And how would it help or or hurt? Look, if, if territorial exchange happens, of course. Uh, so you know, Kosovo will take some part of Serbia that is in uh, south of Serbia, where there are. Albanian villages. So the thing is, what I see right now is Serbia saying that we will not recognize Kosovo. So what's what's the possibility? The other possibility is that Serbia allows uh, Kosovo to uh, uh, join Albania. This could be like you give us uh, the north part of Kosovo, we give you the right to join Albania and be recognized Albania. So this is the only way that Hashim Thaci and others who are supporting uh, Hashim Thaci can sell it in Kosovo, saying, you know, look, we brought the national unification that we always wanted with Albania. The, the thing is that, and you may ask, like, why is, why is Serbia needed here? Is because we have a, a constitutional provision that says that Kosovo has no right to join any other country. When we declared independence, we had this in constitution. We cannot change the constitution without the approval of two thirds of minorities. We have 20 seats that are reserves, reserved for, for minorities. 10 of them are Serbs out of 120. So without Serbs, you can never make a constitutional change in Kosovo. So Serbia can say, okay, we will allow you to do that, to change that provision in your constitution, and then join Albania, you will give us these territories. So the, this is the only way that it could be solved in Kosovo. But if this happens, the whole Kosovo project as a project for which many people fought, uh, gave energy, died, and so on and so on, Kosovo's project was never a project that is, you know, a territory to be uh, 
submit it to Albania. No, no, we don't think of Kosovo like that. We think of Kosovo as an independent state, as a society that can organize itself, that is prosperous and so on and so on. So for, I will be very sad. I will be definitely very sad if that happens because uh, then Kosovo will fail. You know, we spend a lot of energy for Kosovo not to fail. And my energy spent is nothing compared to lives and years in prison that people uh, had endured for Kosovo to, to be at the point where it is now. And this very weak point and stuff. So if that happens, and if Kosovo joins uh, Albania and we create a strong state, I don't think that Serbia will stop there. Serbia will ask for Republika Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then Albanians will start rebelling and saying, okay, we in Western Macedonia, we also want to join now. Then I don't know. Uh, everybody will start asking this. Maybe Albanians in Switzerland, there are like 200,000 in Switzerland, they also, also want to join. You know, this is a, the most crazy thing ever. We had the special emissar of EU in Kosovo. He just finished the visit today. He was, um, for the very first time, somebody from EU is not respected in Kosovo. They, for example, a party that is now in power, uh, it's uh, Ramus Haradinaj, who was prime minister uh, before Kurti. He didn't, uh, he didn't receive him in his office, in his party's office office, he let the vice president of the party to, uh, to receive uh, Lajčak, who is the special emissar of EU in Kosovo Serbia talks. So, and he said, if you uh, leave us out, you will, this means out of the process of negotiations with Co Kosovo and Serbia negotiations, for which EU is more moderate, they don't allow territorial exchange and stuff. He said, if you leave us out, that means that you leave yourself out of EU integration. This was today, uh, Thursday. Now, uh, I hope that Germany will be more active to prevent this happening. You know, it's very unfair uh, because this is in Europe. Balkans is in Europe. You know, it is unfair for Europe and us that US decides whether we should live in this way or the other way just because Trump's needed for November elections. I mean, this is absolutely crazy. And in Kosovo, US has a lot of respect because of its role in 1999 in liberation of Kosovo from Serbia, from Milosevic. So, you know, Albanians uh, are very, uh, how to say, you, you have to excuse Albanians from Kosovo because, uh, I don't know if you know, I was a refugee in Macedonia, in Gostivar. Uh, in 1999. For three months I was a refugee in Macedonia and Macedonia is my second motherland and maybe you notice that I don't call it North Macedonia. It, it will always be Macedonia for me. So, uh, you know, uh, for me as a kid, as 10 year old kid, kid when uh, Kosovo got liberated by NATO, we seen it as America because NATO was driven by America. You know, as a kid I have it embedded that we have to be thankful to, towards America. So I've read some of the books that are there and now I realize what really happened, that there was a geostrategic, uh, you know, uh, interest, not only, not only, not, they don't love us for sure. There was some interest involved, you know, and now it's very hard for me as an activist or a person who is very often in media to explain to people that didn't read that much books that, you know, we should have a more sane, and more uh, healthy relationship with America, because what we have right now is a masochistic uh, relationship with America. We feel okay if America punishes us because that also means that they care for us. You know, this is the mentality of a victim of, uh, of a sadist. Uh, I'm not saying that America is violating us on purpose all the time, but for example, with Grenal, when it happened, Albanians feel like but this is okay because America cares for us. You know, at least they are dealing with us. So people are not, how to say, we don't have a strong education system 
anywhere in Balkans to expect from people to be very critical about these kind of processes. So it's it's very hard to fight against this this thing to come from 27th of June, the the possible agreement or whatever it will be. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think we could. I mean, I couldn't agree more with what you said, uh, especially about the last part uh, about U.S. and and how people perceive it, especially in Kosovo and what are the reasons for it. I wanted to continue and move along this conversation with something that's almost uh, one month old now. You became really famous, uh, or like people uh, got to hear you on live live TV uh, confronting Edin. Uh, uh, so, can you tell us for those that don't know Albanian and could not watch it and, and listen to it? Can you tell us what happened? What did you ask him? What was his answer? Uh, since the last elections in Kosovo, I was involved in a TV that was one of the most viewed uh, TVs. Uh, I was involved as a, a panelist uh, during the elections, so I had chance to be part of those uh, panelist interviews with all candidates for prime minister. So, uh, and yeah, I, I did my job. Uh, but after the elections, these debates continue. So they continued calling me in a TV show uh, almost every night, uh, talking about politics and stuff that was going on in Kosovo. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, in Tirana, they had this theater in uh, Tirana. So uh, that was an old theater that was uh, uh, built in fascist times. So it was built when King Zogu was in charge. Uh, uh, some Italian architects built that theater. It was a weak building, but how to say, uh, uh, a functional one. And Eddie Roma wanted to remove the theater and to cre create a new theater, a modern one. The actors and activists refused this. They said, you know, it's very important for us because even though it was built during fascist regime in 42 or 3, it was finished. They say, like, the whole history of national theater in Albania is there, you know, and it has uh, an important, uh, how to say, uh, it is uh, an important moment of collective memory of Albanian society in Albania. And uh, for 27, 26 months, activists occupied the theater and didn't allow anybody to touch it. And a month ago, uh, Edi Rama, uh, the problem is why they refuse so much to remove the theater is that Edi Rama, what was doing until now is that he was tearing down some old buildings and they were giving it to oligarchs to build huge towers in the middle of Tirana uh, for their uh, profit. So people knew that this will happen also with theater because there was a project proposed by an old oligarch in Albania because Albania is controlled by oligarchs, not by Edirama. Uh, so uh, he proposed this idea of uh, uh, making a new theater, but also two huge towers in the same uh, area so that you know he can develop his businesses there. Uh, so activists refused, and what he did is that uh, Rama ordered uh, uh, the police at five o'clock in the morning to enter violently, uh, arresting people and destroying the theater in a very, uh, in a very shocking way. You know, you don't do that in the middle of pandemic. Moreover. And then people started protesting that day. The protests were more massive than they are usually in Tirana because they also have this problem of political apathy as we have all, all over the Balkans. But the protest was quite solid. And in, uh, during the night, we had the TV show uh, where Edi Rama was connected via Skype. And my colleagues, uh, 
They ashamed me with a question because there were people that were beaten, beaten in the streets of Tirana while protesting. And I'm an activist who protests and I'm an activist who solidarizes with uh, his fellows uh, all over the Balkans. As, as I told you, I participated in protests against Gruevsky. I participated in protests in Belgrade. I, as much as I can, I participate in protests all over the Balkans. Um, so uh, I was ashamed by my colleagues who were asking very easy questions to Edirama. And that's why he didn't go in televisions in Albania, but he came in, you know, he accepted in Kosovo because people in Kosovo are polite with the prime minister of Albania, as they would be most likely also with Zaire, you know, because it's the prime minister and so on. And I told him, you know, I, after they finished the questions, I was like, I cannot allow you to make, to do propaganda in front of me. So what you did was terrible. And actually, I read an article of Edi Rama of 2010 when he said, when another guy was in power, he said, what, and that guy wanted to tear down a building. Edi Rama wrote, this is the Taliban way of doing things. And I told him, I am going to use your category. What you did was a terrorist thing. And you are a terrorist, you know? You, you terrorized the whole... Uh, Albania, because terrorization doesn't mean only ISIS with bombs. It's when you terrorize people. He actually terrorized people. And he, and I was wearing uh, black uh, clothes, you know, uh, because of the pandemic. And he didn't know anything about me. He didn't expect that. And he started saying things like, you with black cloths and he was mentioning it all all the time and i am uh, i am a person who stays very calm when i argue with people so i was just doing with hand like this like yeah you can continue whatever he was saying like you don't care for the theater look at your face it can be seen from your face that you never go to theater actually my face it's not that now uh, but my face looks like very uh, a face that goes in theater a lot, even though I didn't have time that much, but you know. <laughs> uh, so he, he didn't know what to, to do. So he was talking stupid things. And I was, and he said like, listen to me, I will teach you something. I just said, you cannot teach me anything you're not capable of. You can teach me only how to be authoritarian in your country. That's the only thing you can teach me. And these kind of like small uh, answers that I gave to him, but for some reason, in Albania, this was amazing because they didn't expect a Kosovo Albanian to be that, uh, I mean, I was correct, but for them, this was great because as it seems, nobody does this to him in television live because most probably he selects who is going to be in the television. So he didn't expect me doing that. And I became very famous in Albania overnight. I started being called in TV debate there via Skype, talking about things. People liked me a lot for some reason. A lot of people added me <laughs> from Albania. I supported the next protests. Uh, I posted some pictures, uh, you know, supporting them. And especially, uh, I, I did a picture with the, the Albanian eagle. Uh, I, w I was wearing black cloths so that I provoke him again. And then the next two days, he was in parliament and he was talking something and he said, and yeah, you then have this analphabet, this illiterate from Kosovo with black gloves who will accuse me and so on. So, so he continued dealing with me, which uh, makes us think that uh, he was hurt by that interview because he never does this in parliament. So yeah. And... Uh, yeah, but I don't think I, I did anything special. So I, what I said, I learned from activists in Tirana, and I actually in next uh, in next shows that I were invited there, I took advantage of promoting the movement uh, for university that uh, is in Tirana. It's a similar activist like us who are dealing with education issues there. They were quite successful uh, last year. They were quite inspirational because. 
they had this huge protest of 10,000 people, maybe 10,000 students protesting against semester fees and stuff like this. Uh, so, and they are not in television that much because uh, in Albania, the freedom of media is a bit lower than in Kosovo. So I, I promoted them and I mentioned them in every interview. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is uh, all about it. Uh, I think it was more like a mistake of Rama that made me uh, made me have, I don't know, a star there, not that I said something very special. I was very saying very simple things, but he was continuing to do mistakes, trying to offend me and, you know, making me angry so that I fall into that level, but I didn't. I stayed calm because I have no emotions about him, you know, I don't care what the drama says about my face. Like, you know, I feel handsome. <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess the, this uh, in, in this context, patience is a virtue. Uh, so, so of course, the, the, this is only your first time confronting with uh, with power structures. You've done that since you were a student. So it's yeah. not like your um, your political activities started like now, but they were as a student. So there is this like from our research that we done uh, for the interview we have this sort of uh, scandal, if you might call it, the red paint. I, I would call it the red paint scandal. Uh, and that was when, when you confronted your university on submissions. So can you tell us something about your student, student activism when you were a student at university and what you did there and how, how students organized back in, when, when you were still active? Uh, in 2010, uh, we established in University of Pristina, we founded an organization, a student organization that was independent from uh, political parties. In the sense that it would deal with proper things, not like these imaginary things that student organization uh, usually uh, dealt with. Um, so we, could, we started something like your, uh, I think, uh, president of student parliament is Borian Eftimov in University of Skopje. So it was, uh, we thought that we are going to do that, but we never managed to do that. We never took the, the, uh, the parliament. However, we established this organization that fought against uh, semester fees that were increasing at that time, the prices for the semester fees. So, uh, we, I don't know, in Kosovo, the semester fee is 25 euros per semester. Uh, we managed to do that because of a lot of protests. So, you know, we made it cool for politicians to, pro to promise that they are going to decrease the semester fees. But uh, that happened since 2010, you know, I, until 2014. Uh, so, now we pay only 20, we would pay like only 25 euros per semester. I think this is the cheapest in Balkan. Um, so uh, in 2011, uh, as I was leading this organization, we decided to do something because at that time, media was not covering education that much. Um, and in, I'm a generation of, uh, people who uh, didn't have that much social media as we have now. So I don't know if you can imagine a student organization having the only way, uh, the television was the only way to, to promote something. And to go in television, you have to do something big because they just don't put you there. Uh, in 2011 was the 40, first anniversary of University of Pristina. And University of Pristina was looked as this sacred institution because of 1997 protests of Albin Kurti, because University of Pristina was the key point of the resistance against Milosevic. So it had a lot of symbolic power among the population of Kosovo. And on its 41st anniversary, we decided to enter the ceremony and threw red paint on the rector who was the most corrupt person in university. Together with a friend and a colleague activist, we managed to enter the ceremony and 
to uh, go in the main floor while he was giving the speech going live in all TVs, we managed to throw him a red paint on his face while he was talking. Public was shocked. We were arrested, sent in prison for one month. I was expelled from university. I was studying at that time engineering physics um, in University of Pristina in Department of uh, Scientific uh, of uh, Exact Sciences. So yeah, that was it. But from that point and on, media started uh, digging more in university. What is going on there? Why, why that, that happened? Because I was a student who earned a scholarship of merits. So I was a very good student. So I was not just a thug who was throwing paint, but I was a good student who is throwing paint. So what's happening there? And then I started receiving uh, invitations to go in media and stuff so that I could talk about the problems in university. And uh, that is, uh, that is the, the moment when I became known in Kosovo. And that is the moment when we kind of started being very present in uh, university activism and so on. From that time on, I was never like resting all the time protesting or doing something now uh now i lead an organization orca uh, orca is uh, an organization non-governmental organization that uh, checks on academic integrity we check on plagiarism academic promotions and stuff like this but we combine two methods because you know civil society organizations these ngos non-governmental organizations or non-profit, I don't know how you call them in Macedonia, they are quite corrupt in the sense that they produce these reports uh, where they find out things, but nothing happens. So this only normalizes the bad because we show to the people, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, but we don't do anything. We normalize the bad. So uh, when I... I and some friends decided to uh, establish Orca in 2016. We said, when we go to a donor to ask for money, they will ask us, why another NGO? We said, okay, we will combine research with activism. So Orca, for example, does uh, some research, publishes a publication, but then we continue protesting about it until it, the issue gets solved. And we have solved many issues by now. We have managed uh, to, to deal with a lot of issues that are uh, a bit complex, maybe, uh, like uh, pushing forward for certain regulations that prevent, uh, you know, academic fraud. That is kind of complex. So, of course, we don't know how to do that ourselves but we know who are the main global experts. We bring them through these donors. We hire them, we commission them to write, you know, uh, clever things. And then we advocate for those and we make them happen. When institutions are stuck, we start protesting. And we kind of, we are sometimes very radical. For example, uh, last year, uh, we had this problem with the Council of Ethics who was refusing to take measures against some uh, plagiarism uh, that we caught. Uh, so we took uh, mud, we put it in plastic bag and we threw it in the rectorate's building and we made it all mud and we said, this is your true face. It's a muddy face because, you know, you're cheating. You're saying that you have a Council of Ethics that doesn't do anything. And that is quite, I would say, I wasn't sure how donors would react, but uh, you have to try. And we tried it and no donor said to us anything bad. They were just like, okay, it's your method. Uh, but I think that uh, nonprofit organizations are quite often uh, afraid and they do this auto-censorship of their activities and steps that they can take because they think that donors will not let them do things. But actually donors don't care. They give you the money, you use it properly, and they are just fine with that. So 
I think uh, the difference of Ron in 2011, who threw dread paint, was a Ron who can only say what is bad, protest about it, and doesn't bother to find a solution. Ron now also proposes a solution, but if the solution, if they don't do anything, Ron against protests. Even though I'm in television, maybe with Eddie Rama, with Prime Minister of Albania, you can find me tomorrow in a protest. Uh, I mean, this is all my colleagues are doing the same. Uh, activists in Kosovo, uh, free me uh, media in Kosovo is quite freer than anywhere in Balkans. I mean, uh, now, uh, the, because there is, uh, how to say, there are no media that are con controlled only by one party. So all parties have some ties to some media. And there is no like strong, the strongest media that can uh, put it under shadow the others. So we have this media, uh, I'd say fight uh, for taking the best news. So we take advantage of it. We do activities, we do symbolic actions, we do protests. Uh, we try to be as much creative as we can in order to draw their attention, to be in media, to, you know, push uh, our agenda forward. Uh, so yeah, I think this is also an advantage that all activists have in Kosovo. So it is quite acceptable in Kosovo for me to go as an activist uh, in the media to talk with prime minister in a TV debate, but also to be in protest. This doesn't, how to say, harm your uh, reputation or your profile or anything. It's, it's, it's just okay. And I think it happens because we have freer media uh, in Kosovo. Because I know uh, in time of uh, Gruevski, I've seen, uh, for example, uh, news that uh, uh, portals were closed and televisions were closed and stuff also happens in Tirana. Uh, in Pristina never, never occurred such a thing. Like a go government, and this is also because of a, a bit stronger presence of internationals in Kosovo. You know, uh, internationals in Kosovo, because we were not independent, had more, more saying in uh, a lot of issues. So now society created some standards, uh, for example, in media, in prison, uh, prison conditions are quite, quite good in Kosovo compared to others in the region. That is because internationals, uh, especially UN administration, put some standards that are like optimal, globally optimal. And now you cannot go below those standards. So uh, media is also one of those standards that, we, that was created by internationals. Now we kind of uh, manifest it and use it for our purpose. Yeah, so Ron, I wanted to extend on the subject of education. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what is the current situation in Kosovo in regards to education? What kind of do does Kosovo have any problems with education and what are those and and what uh, and what activities do some people take to potentially repair those uh, mishaps? We have the highest salaries for teachers and professors in the region, even though we are the poorest economy in the region. Uh, we have. Um, quite good uh, system of academic promotions, I would say. Uh, our agency of accreditation of universities and programs was part of ENCA until the government of Haradina that was previous to Kurti made some political interventions and we got expelled. We are working, ORCA is now working with the agency of accreditation to prepare them. Uh, we are bringing consultants from uh, Europe to prepare them for a next, uh, uh, next application to ENCA. ENCA is like the association, uh, the European Association of uh, Accreditation Agencies in Europe. Uh, the, why is this important? This is important because if you finish uh, studies in, in a program that is accredited by an agency that is part of ENCA, it is easier for you to go in uh, Europe and study abroad. It's a bit easier. 
for example, I finished my studies in a program that was accredited by Kosovo uh, agency at that time was part of ENCA. So my diploma is, uh, how to say, uh, uh, an easier one to earn scholarships in Europe and in uh, European higher education uh, area. So in some regards, we are better. But when, when it comes to example PISA results, 76% of our students, according to PISA results, do not know how to read. That means they know how to read words, but they don't understand the meaning of it. There is also an explanation about that. You know, we in Kosovo, we use a, a dialect of Albanian that is Geek. Albanian dialect, Albanian standard language is more, more uh, based on Tosk uh, dialect that is Southern Albania's dialect. For example, if you take a Southern Albanian and a Northern Albanian and you meet them, the chances for them not to understand very well each other are quite big if they have not been educated enough. In, uh, so if they have not been educated in, uh, let's say, bachelor degree or master's, the possibility that they don't, they don't understand each other is quite big. So now imagine our students, I mean, uh, primary school students, they speak in the streets, uh, in, in their families everywhere, the gag dialect. And then all the lessons are in Tosk dialect in standard language. So for them, it's always hard to express themselves or to understand texts that are uh, in standard. But I don't think that this is the main problem that uh, brought that percentage because we have similar percentage, a failure percentage in math and sciences, which means that our system of education is quite weak. And as I told you, the population is the youngest in Europe and one of the youngest in the world. So forget about the national, uh, I don't know, the, they say that we have natural uh, resources and so on and so on. I think that is a big lie. That is a kind of nationalistic lie in Kosovo that is, you know, sold, I guess, also in Macedonia and everywhere. Our main resource is youth we are the youngest population in Europe. And with a proper system of education, you can do things that Switzerland did, that Iceland did, that everybody did. So when it comes to, uh, how to say, scientific production, we are better than Albania, for example, which is quite weird because you expect Albania to have a better system of education than Kosovo, but it's not the case. We have similar, uh, uh, scientific product to Macedonia. Of course, Serbia is ahead of all us. But what is very interesting is that Montenegro, with only 600,000 uh, inhabitants, has more uh, scientific product than we do. I think more, also more than Macedonia. So now this should concern us. Uh, of course, we also have the similar problems, uh, because I know your problems. Uh, I, I talked to Borian a lot, uh, the president of the student parliament. And uh, I mean, I know activists there. I, we have the similar problems with professors, with political parties uh, being involved in university, in education, everywhere. Uh, however, um, I, I, am, uh, I am a person that is optimistic. I have seen changes. Uh, very fast changes in education system in Kosovo. I am, I am absolutely sure that they, that the changes can be done, but I have never witnessed any change happening without our push, without our sacrifice, without our energy being spent a lot, and that is the also the thing that uh, is uh, applies to your situation. If you don't uh, make another protest as you did three or four years ago, I mean, Macedonian society. It was the biggest protest in Balkans at that time on education issues. 
that was huge. I remember at that time it was an inspiration for all of us. Uh, if you do don't do that again, uh, the things are not going to be uh, uh, to be uh, improved. Together with uh, Borian and some other activists in Albania, we had this uh, student congress uh, last year in Duras, in Albania. Uh, we have uh, uh, approved a resolution uh, that kind of um, articulates the main problems of three societies and we have kind of um, uh, also uh, dealt that we are going to try to further the circle, to expand the circle of activists among Western Balkan countries and to try to advocate as Western Balkan activists towards EU uh, because I think that one of the tools that we can use is like if we convince EU that uh, uh, in order for the European integration to happen, uh, to put some conditions on education as well. So uh, they are putting uh, uh, conditions only in, uh, you know, security matters, economy and so on. They are not focusing in education. So we can continue our fight within our countries. But let's also start, try, put EU on motion and uh, convince them that there should be some conditions regarding EU, uh, regarding education in order for our governments to be more uh, cooperative with us. Even though we in Kosovo, to be honest, uh, we have a quite, uh, quite good uh, cooperation with government. I remember that when we were in Macedonia, activists and non-governmental organizations were complaining about, you know, not being participating in uh, the drafting of laws and other uh, administrative documents. Uh, while uh, in Kosovo, there is like a regulation, governmental regulation that says that you cannot start as government or as a ministry, any kind of uh, law changing or any, uh, so making a new document without consulting civil society. So they, there, that is a must. So we take advantage of that. And I, for example, I participate in a lot of working groups, drafting new laws and new regulations. And then we also push through protests and stuff. So yeah, I think that we should use all the tools that are there in order to, to push our agenda further, which is improvement of uh, uh, quality in education. The, the other thing that what you said here is uh, the problems that you you face in Kosovo, but also here, they're basically the same. Maybe the of course the national context is different, but the problems are the same for young people because um, I feel like as young people we're more international than the sort of like focus on the domestic. So I think I think it's good that we have cooperation. Uh, on, sort of on behalf of between states, uh, especially among students. The thing I want to ask you is what are your, um, how do you see the future of the Western Balkans, especially the, especially the role of young people in the Western Balkans, but also their role in the process of reconciliation uh, of sort of the ethnic tensions that are still around here? There are two uh, main reasons why I insist in regional cooperation. First is that when I see a letter of solidarity coming from Skopje, I know it uh, doesn't have any real power, but it makes me feel very, very good. Whenever I had that, I felt very, very good, no matter from where it comes. Uh, it is very important for activists to see that their struggle is not impossible because there are also other people trying to do the same in other countries and other societies. When people, when activists see this, they easily uh, get inspired and they easily kind of uh, continue with their activism. Otherwise, there is this possibility of desperation and giving up. So I think this is very important for us to know that all governments are behaving like this, not only in the region, but also elsewhere in the world. 
there are always tendencies to, you know, decrease the quality in education because of different policies, uh, because governments are interested in other topics that bring success more fast, in a fast way, so they can sell it for the next elections. It's all, it, all, it is happening all, everywhere in the world. But of course, we have similar problems. And I mean, if, if you see that we are facing similar problems and we are having some success, then you will be more hopeful that you will achieve the same. The other thing is that I think that our region is very, very small. And I guess none of you have been in Pristina ever. Is this correct? Unfortunately, not. Yeah. A couple of times. Uh, it is very weird for me because it's uh, one hour and a half to go from Pristina to Skopje and vice versa. I go a lot in Skopje since forever. Uh, I go a lot in Tirana. I go a lot in Belgrade. We from Pristina go a lot in all capitals, but I don't see the same happening from other capitals towards Pristina. This is weird because, you know, the, our region is very small. Maybe I understand why people don't come from Belgrade to Pristina because it's six hours uh, road. But from Skopje to Pristina, I don't understand this. Because you can take a bus, it costs only five euros in one direction. So, I, you know, it's, there is no reason why not to do it, just out of curiosity. So, as, if we increase the exchange of students, you will meet more people that are like you and not, uh, and you will there was some prejudices as I did. So when I was for the first time in Belgrade, I thought that people will, will eat me when they realize that I'm from Kosovo. But absolutely the opposite happened. They all kind of adored me and started asking me questions and they were very curious about Kosovo and why I, I am there and it always happens. So, or for example, when I realized that in Belgrade, there is this, uh, building that is called called Palace Albania, Albania. I couldn't imagine it. You know, I was like, what is happening here? Or there is a, a street called George Castriotti, you know, Skanderbeg. I was like, what is happening? Or the main street of Kafanas in Belgrade is called Skadarlia, which is like uh, Škodra, a city in, uh, in Albania. Uh, this was you know, for a Kosovo, it is very unexpected thing. So yeah, I think uh, as an, when Serbs met me, uh, for I, I have to tell you this, when I was first time in Belgrade, I was walking with a group of uh, Kosovo Albanians. We visited the uh, parliament of Serbia. We went through a non-governmental organization. And uh, this is also interesting to tell. Uh, when we go in Serbia, they take our ID and they give us a paper, as Greece used to do with your passports. So that paper is more valuable than my ID card that is more, you know, like more, how to say, more original, because you can really know if whether the, that is me or not through my ID than uh, with a paper that just says the name. So, but when we went to Serbian parliament to visit, the regulation says that it should be a document with picture. And then we all got our IDs when there is Republika Kosovo, uh, Kosovo, Republic of Kosovo, you know? And they had to accept that in order for us to visit the Serbian parliament. It was amazing. For example, when I was sitting in one of the rooms uh, and I remember from a documentary that the same room was uh, Milosevic uh, taking a decision over Kosovo. And, you know, I was sitting just there. Milosevic is not there anymore. You know, I am, everybody knows that I'm from Kosovo and I'm there. And that was a great, you know, kind of symbolic victory. And then when we got out, we were walking and there was, and I was kind of looking at the buildings, you know, I, I was very curious about buildings. I, I lost the group. And then uh, an old Serbian lady comes to me and say in Serbian, like, 
šta su ovi, odakle su ovi, you know, in Srbije, and I was like, mi smo svi iz Kosova. And she was like, i ti si Šiptar? I was like, yes, I'm Albanian, you know, da, ja sam Albanac. She was like, ali ti ne izgledaš kao Šiptar? Because she was expecting me to have the white head or, I don't know, mustache, or I don't know, I look maybe like German to her. And then, even though she was offending me with that Shiptar thing, she didn't meant to, you know, she is used to, to say it like that. And, you know, and then my group came because they were like, oh, Ron doesn't know anybody in Belgrade, like, why is he speaking to an old lady? And then when everybody came, she was like, you know, she was totally shocked why we don't look like savages or I don't know. So I think this is very important to describe why we should go to each other's cities. Because you will see that an Albanian and or a Macedonian or anybody is, you know, as you are, faces the same problems, faces the same difficulties. And then you see Vucic, Hashim Tachi, all of those signing agreements, drinking together, eating dinners together, and then you have to realize, you know, the real shit is going there, you know, this is not our shit and we have to deal with this. And I think that uh, if we do this more, uh, politicians will not be able to sell a nationalistic approach in the future. Uh, so that's why I think these two things are very important. Solidarity in one uh, hand, and on the other hand, knowing each other more and our problems will bring us more together. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I haven't been to Pristina yet, but definitely I, I agree with what you said about visiting and meeting uh, people all around the Balkans. Uh, I, interestingly enough, I don't know how much you know, but we don't have, like in Kosovo, there is a baseball federation. Uh, so I had a chance last year, we had a group of, uh, group of young students and, uh, and some coaches coming to Skopje to practice with our baseball team. Uh, so I've formed uh, quite a few relationship, rela relationships with them and it, it has been interesting to play baseball and have fun. Uh, but we could not manage to uh, get our team from here to go there. Uh, just a lot of different stuff, and then Corona happened, so we can't even play baseball even here. But what I'm trying to say is that we could find so many different things that connect us. I mean, baseball is an American sport, and that's how – I mean, I didn't really know a lot of people from Kosovo be before I met uh, those people that came and played baseball with us. So, and now there are some of my uh, closest friends uh, that I could really consider uh, great friends. And, and it just, it is amazing as you said your story, how people do have a lot of prejudice and, and that's because of these politicians, it's because of their narrative, it's because of the nationalism they're trying to, uh, to put in everyone's uh, mind. Uh, and because we can and we don't have that opportunity to uh, to talk to people different than us and and we don't even know like how different they are because we don't see them and and I'm really glad I mean I we think like, I think we can go on for another hour and talk about all kinds of stuff but I think this is a really good note to end this interview and I'm I'm really happy that we had this opportunity to do this with you and I mean thank you so much for your time and I mean you've probably not seen our show but when we finish our uh, interview with every guest, we ask them, uh, because we're in a state of uh, kind of emergency right now, uh, global pandemic is happening and there's a lot of free time. Uh, so can you give us some recommendations uh, for a book, a movie, a TV show, a music that, I mean, specifically, I would be interested to, to, to hear from you some better ways to like Macedonians or people that are listening to the show are not from Kosovo to educate themselves about more about the history and what is actually happening. So you have any books or some good material to recommend to us. It'll be really nice. Um, I, 
I kind of became an agent of a book in Kosovo because I had a similar talk uh, in Pristina somewhere. And I, uh, for those who are curious about philosophy, I studied, I finished my studies in philosophy uh, last year. That was my first uh, bachelor degree ever. I will not continue to uh, this formal thing anymore. Um, I, uh, I, rec I recommend Sophie's World as a book. It is a great introduction in philosophy. It is kind of novel, but it has all the history of philosophy in it. And it has something very important, the, the, you know, the ability to be curious, how it is lost when we uh, leave childhood and we go in adulthood in adult life, we kind of lose the ability to be curious. And the argument of the book is that that is the problem, that we are not curious anymore. We just don't question things. And I think that book is a great book to, you know, start being uh, involved in philosophy in a very good way. On, uh, since we are in Balkans, I also recommend uh, a book that uh, dropped me out, Nationalism. And that book is called, um, it is from Ernest Gellner, uh, uh, Nationalism. It uh, tells how na nation and nationalism are a social construction. And when you realize that, when you see that, then you will be able to, you know, get out of your national identity and start thinking of some identities that actually are very, very are much more important than national identity. And for us in Balkans, I think that is a crucial point uh, because we, even though we are living with the nationalism a lot, uh, we definitely don't have the luxury to be in nationalistic societies because the territory doesn't allow that to us. We definitely cannot be that. So I recommend these two books, Sophie's World, and uh, nationalism from Ernest Gellner for two groups of people. Those who are interested in more soft and you know, you know, deep stuff, uh, then you read Sophie's World. If you are more into concrete political, you know, uh, stuff, then read Ernest Gellner nationalism for both. It's it's great. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ron. And hopefully, the next time we get together and have you again on on the podcast, you'll be in person in Pristina, where you'll host us uh, for for an episode and a trip there. Uh, so, yeah, stay safe. And for those that are listening, uh, yeah, we're uh, having uh, every other Sunday uh, episode. Uh, hopefully, the next time we'll have someone. Uh, that will again attract your interest and and hopefully it's going to be as good as as this one stay safe everyone